Uh, hello, everyone. Presumably, if you're here, you're interested in Spinnaker or the. Oh, more? Is that better? Okay. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, presumably, if you're here, you're interested in Spinnaker or the modernization journey that uh, is happening in the industry at large, you know, moving from on prem services to public cloud. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about developer experience, uh, golden paths, cognitive overload, and we're definitely going to touch on all those areas today. Um, tying it specifically to Spinnaker, so you know, we have this concept of like a happy pipeline, and from an adoption lens, really all that means is just a pipeline that works. Um, I know it's not revolutionary, but it's important to highlight because Spinnaker is declarative, which means it's not going to hold your hand. Uh, it's going to give you the building blocks and say, here you go. Um, so a lot of the work that we did is essentially, in various different ways, sort of remove that flexibility and give people uh, a pattern that they can adopt and deploy and get up to speed relatively quickly. Um, so bef before we move on, a quick introduction. I don't have an introduction slide. Here's my face, for better or for worse. <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Jamie O'Byrne. I am a senior associate at JP Morgan Chase, based in Houston. Worked for the continuous delivery, uh, delivery team for about three years. Also, all views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of JP Morgan Chase and Co. So, um, a bit of context. This is sort of like a part two to a previous talk that happened last year. Uh, I've linked it in the slides, which should be up already. Um, but to sort of restate the problem statement, you know, at JP Morgan we have over 50,000 developers, thousands of applications, millions of deployments a day, and the question is how do you move that level of operation from managed infrastructure on-prem to the public cloud, and let alone with a foreign tool. Um, so, like I said, this has been an ongoing journey for over a year, so here are some numbers from last year to Q1 of this year. Uh, not sure how visible the numbers are, um, but just to kind of give you an idea, on the left-hand side, ECS monthly deployments. So we have the legacy tool and Spinnaker. And uh, total deployments for ECS were 51,000. Spinnaker deployed 44,000 of them, so that's 85% of the market share. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, which is even better, uh, for EKS deployments, we have 78,000 total deployments. Spinnaker deployed 71 of 71,000 of those, which was 91% uh, of the market share. So how do we do this? I've kind of separated into three different uh, sections, um, but they all kind of interact with each other or feed directly into each other, and that's uh, paid roads market research, and bulk migrations, which we'll get into how we did bulk migrations. We're, we're very fortunate at JP Morgan. Uh, we're very big on uh, paved roads. So we have like an entire blueprints team that we were able to leverage. Um, this involves managing frameworks, dependencies um, for infrastructure. We have a team that creates infrastructure modules, uh, which you know, couples all like the wiring of different services and ensures that they meet regulatory controls. All of this is like served to users via, um, think of like a spring initializer UI. It's just like supercharged and it'll also include your build and deployment configuration files. Um, and so we really leverage those to drive enablement. Um, and th this is all good stuff, but blueprints will kind of only get you half of the way there, so it'll get people using your tool very easily. It doesn't necessarily lead to adoption. So this is like your Hello World app, you deploy to dev, and then you're like, okay, cool, what now? <laughs> um, and so to figure out you know, which users were taking it all the way to production versus those who weren't, uh, you need data. So we became obsessed about our customers. What were they doing? How were they doing it? What needs weren't being met? Uh, getting this data, depending on your ecosystem, will be trivial or impossible. <laughs> Luckily for us, we were able to get deployment data from our evidence store. And then uh, for our legacy system, that, those pipeline definitions were uh, defined as code. And so we were able to scan uh, targeted repositories and sort of create like a one-to-one -one mapping between how someone would do something in the legacy system and how they would accomplish the same thing over in Spinnaker. 
And so with this data, we were able to do bulk migrations. So internally, we developed our own Puppiness code solution for Spinnaker. And now that we have this data of what people were doing before on the legacy tool, and we knew how that would work in Spinnaker, we were able to essentially write recipes with Open Rewrite. If you're not familiar with Open Rewrite, it's basically a source code uh, refactor tool. It automates that process for users. So something that a user would have had to done manually, um, they can now just apply this recipe and then they're done. And so we published those, they're self-service, it's great, um, but we didn't stop there. <laughs> we then partnered with a separate migration team. And I'll get into the workflow of that uh, a little bit later, but you know, we have blueprints, we have these recipes, we can't cover every single deployment pattern, so we thought, how can we make the users be part of the solution? where they can contribute their own deployment patterns. And that's where the pipeline template marketplace um, kind of came about. So to this migration flow, before any of this even starts, um, we approach the migration team, we give them a list of repositories and say, we need you to migrate these repositories. They'll then scan all of the repos, apply the recipe to every single one, and raise a pull request on the user's behalf. Um, I can't remember the name, but earlier there was a, a talk from a principal engineer at Comcast, and he said, you know, we want to do stuff for users, not to the user. And so this is like a perfect example of that. Uh, also, coincidentally, the pipeline as code um, tool that we developed in-house uh, follows this exact same model to apply uh, to like create your pipelines in Spinnaker. So it just kind of happened to coincide perfectly with this, which is great. And then the pipeline template marketplace, here's some data, some of the offerings that we offer. 12.8% um, is not necessarily like the most bombastic number you may see, but uh, keep in mind this is uh, a like feature in a developer portal where the number one use case, I think it was like around 40%, people go to this portal to deploy their pipelines. I think the second most used was uh, downloading their pipeline as code file directly from Spinnaker. So we're pretty happy with these numbers. This is all just in Q1. So what do we learn from the migration process, right? Um, obsess about your customer. Um, I, I cannot stress that enough. This will apply in regardless of what organization you're at. It will always be a good idea. Uh, build on what you have, leverage other teams. Uh, I think literally the previous talk was talking about that. Um, uh, also, we wanna reduce friction points, but we wanna make sure that they're the right ones. So if you're migrating a user and they're blocked, then all of a sudden you have a sort of higher priority to get them moving as opposed to just trying to massage everything where you know they click one button and you're done. Um, and then the last point kind of segues into uh, some of the friction points that we face using Spinnaker. So it's a great deployment tool, but it's not like a full-fledged CD platform. Uh, <laughs> So one of, one of the things um, that I love about Spinnaker is that it's really extendable. Uh, you can create your own custom plugins and do whatever you want with it. Um, but if we wanted to have like a user contribution model, it's not really gonna work. You need to be sort of an expert and know like everything about the ecosystem. And that's just like, if learning the tool just to use it is a steep learning curve, um, asking them to contribute via plugins is sort of like an even step further removed. Um, missing features, also like we couldn't focus on adoption when we were doing uh, feature work. So some of the stuff we had to do for our users was um, database deployments, S3 deployments, and again, pipeline as code. <sighs> Identity. Um, so how, how can I put this? So if you're an individual contributor or a vendor and you have a deployment tool and the, the deployment tool needs to do X, but you need Y, in order to do X. I want you to ask yourself, how would your tool function if you couldn't get Y? Could we provide Z instead, perhaps? Um, I know it's really vague, but I hope that makes sense. Um, the next point is not really Spinnaker related, but I figured I'd talk about it because looking at other implementations of Pipeline as Code kind of follow the same strategy that we did, where you have a single source of truth in one branch, typically your main or master, this ended up being such a contentious uh, workflow for a lot of users. Like it was literally a blocker for adoption. 
Um, just kind of want to highlight that. I don't know if that's like an internal expectation. We, we can get into it later if people have questions. Um, and then the last point is Spinnaker has uh, the idea of like a mutable infrastructure. So you create a pipeline, it gets saved into a database. Um, you then have to deal with the fact that it's in a database. <laughs> so if you need to change them uh, on mass, you kind of have like a mini migration on your hands, um, which is not always great. And obviously asking the users is a non-starter. Um, now I know I kind of beat up on Spinnaker for a bit there, but understand I'm only doing this because this is a tool that works. <laughs> there are other tools that have the exact same pain points or just straight up uh, we're not able to get working within the firm. Uh, so I really hope uh, for you know individual contributors or vendors if you're listening, you know these are really opportunities to provide solutions. And uh, before we wrap up, I just want to give a quick shout out to Nick and Toby. They were originally the people who were supposed to present this talk. Um, they're from uh, London. Uh, in fact, the whole London team was really behind the adoption for Spinnaker. So shout out to Praveen, uh, Joseph, Shemek. <laughs> I'm sure there's more. But uh, really thank you for your work and you're the reason we were able to share the success today. Um, so that's all I have. Great question. Um, so we send data to an evidence store, and we only send that data whenever it's a successful deployment. Uh, and we follow a similar pattern with a legacy tool. So we're able to sort of get the aggregate data that way, because everything is stored in, e in evidence, basically. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, can you say that again? How complex is it how how complex is it managing Spinnaker? Is that the question? Um Yeah, we have a pretty sizable team um uh, like uh, across across the globe, we have some in North America, some in Europe, some in uh, India, um, and we've kind of divided into like functional areas. So, uh, yeah, we we have like one that does features, one that does like platform stuff, other ones focuses on developer experience. So, shout out to the London team because that's <laughs> exactly what I went over. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I, it's kind of hard to hear. Sorry. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience? Sure. So you mentioned about offering an open API uh, that would make opponents convert things like pump and that way. Yes. What uh, Spinnaker will understand. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if uh, this are you hand holding all of the users um, in terms of adoption in this case? Like, meaning um, once you execute open rewrite to convert the configuration, it is runnable. Um, the, the pipeline is as good as it can be run. Yes. Do you right. have to implement customization? In you know while working with open write, uh, open rewrite to implement 
the modifications between S6 existing configuration to Spinnaker configuration? So I'm not familiar too much with the internals, but the basic idea is we have a, a template essentially for uh, deployment to whichever uh, target platform you're uh, aiming for. And then by scanning their legacy deployment file, we're able to see what sort of things they were doing before moving to Spinnaker and then adding those the way that we know that Spinnaker can basically do those things. Uh, okay, so for example, whatever it is in the existing config that does a blue-green blue deployment, for exactly. example, you yeah. convert it into what Spinnaker will understand. Yes. Okay. And uh, the pipeline template marketplace, is, that, is there a community for that or uh, you have to customize it in JP Morgan? So we have like our own templates that we provide, um, but we're also going to let users contribute, which that's like the whole, the whole goal is essentially because we can't uh, cover every single use case. Okay, so, yeah. and this is just like internal in a way, like yes. Un yes. unlike GitHub Action Marketplace, for example. Correct. It's <laughs> this, is, this is internal only. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. or another system? Uh, I'll ask again. What are you using to manage your template marketplace? Is it something like Backstage or another application? Um, we have our own internal like developer portal. So it's just like a component of that portal. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you, everyone.